So this will be the last video on specific defences from the Unit 3 of Higher Human Biology and it will cover immune memory. So a lot of this stuff when you talk about it in exam questions, people talk about things being remembered. Now just the same as in memory, when we talk about things being recalled, we don't say remembered. We wouldn't say remembered in this, okay? When it involves immune memory, as much as we talk about immune memory, the cells don't remember anything. The cells don't have a brain, the cells don't think, they don't recall or remember anything. They're just there and they'll act in the way that they act, okay? So don't use the term remember. So to quickly give you an introduction to immune memory, okay? When you have lymphocytes that bind to foreign antigens and pathogens, they produce clones, okay? And we know this already. So that's a totally normal response for all lymphocytes. And it won't matter which type of lymphocyte it is. This will be the case for B and for T lymphocytes. So these clones are then used to destroy the antigens and destroy the pathogens and then get rid of that infection. But the important thing is that for you to be able to fight that infection again in the future, if you come into contact with it, some of those clones then need to be kept as memory cells. Okay, so it's key that those cells are then kept in circulation in the body in case you come into contact with that antigen and that pathogen again. Right? So when you first come into contact with an antigen um, and a pathogen that's on the antigen, your initial exposure will then cause lymphocytes to produce clones and then they'll destroy that pathogen. Now you know yourself from having a cold that that process takes, although it isn't really a long time, it feels like a long time. Okay, so that first exposure is quite slow. Okay, so the process to eliminate that um, antigen and those pathogens is quite slow. So that person will still get ill. Right, so you have the symptoms of that disease, whatever it is, and you get rid of it. Okay, so they get rid of it by eventually producing enough lymphocytes to then destroy that pathogen and clear it from the body. Right, but then some of those lymphocytes, both B and T, are kept as memory cells. Right, and the important part of that is then that is for the next time you might come into contact with it. All right. So that's what's called your secondary response when you have to deal with that same antigen and same pathogen again. So I've got F or when, but it's pretty much when. Okay, the body comes into contact with the same foreign antigen again. Okay, so that second exposure, the memory cells will recognise it. Now, not remember it, they'll recognise it. And they will rapidly produce clones of themselves so that they can then rapidly attack and destroy that pathogen. Right, so that response is much quicker. The second time that you get exposed to a pathogen and an antigen, it is much quicker. Okay, and it's because they produce huge numbers of clones in a really short space of time. It's not like the first time when they've never come across that antigen before. This time now they know what it is. They have receptors that will bind to it and they will produce clones rapidly because they've already found it and they've already come across it before. Okay, so they produce lots of clones and those clones can then destroy it. Now, this happens all the time. You might come into contact with a cold when you're eight and then come into contact with it again when you're 11. When you're 11, you don't develop symptoms because your immune system has got these memory cells, okay, which will recognise it and produce clones so quickly that it destroys it before you develop symptoms. All right, so in an example um, of a question, normally it will have a, a graph, okay, which is why I've got this here. Now this graph can either have number of lymphocytes at the side or it can have concentration of antibodies. So your primary response will then be slow and it will increase the number of lymphocytes or it'll increase the concentration of antibodies and it'll take a fairly long time so that um, slope isn't particularly steep. Okay? And it'll produce a certain number of antibodies or a certain number of lymphocytes and then it'll destroy it and these will drop down, but it'll never drop down to zero because you'll keep some of those as memory cells. Now your secondary response, when you come into contact with that um, antigen and that pathogen again, is your cells will bind to it and will immediately start producing clones. Okay, so the rate at which you produce those lymphocytes and the rate at which you might produce antibodies is far, um, far faster and far greater that would be before. Okay, and notice how the number and the concentration of antibodies goes up much higher. 
Okay, and therefore it is broken down and destroyed far quicker. And then again, that will drop down. Okay, so that secondary response is faster. And if it's antibodies, it's at a greater concentration or a greater number of cells. So a greater concentration of antibodies is produced or a greater number of cells is produced. So a greater number of lymphocytes, for example. Okay, so this is a common question to compare those two and to describe the difference between primary and secondary response. Right, and that response, that secondary response, is due to memory cells. Okay, either B or T lymphocyte memory cells. Now the last part of this um, immune memory is actually just a kind of drop in at the end and it's about HIV. HIV has been quite, um, quite commonly talked about of late because of the TV show It's a Sin on Channel 4 um, which talks about HIV and AIDS. And HIV and AIDS came out um, and came to kind of the forefront in the kind of 80s. Um, it's transmitted through blood and through other bodily fluids. Um, not really by saliva and things, more, more like blood and other bodily fluids. So you can get them if those blood samples aren't tested through blood transfusions, which is why blood transfusions now are really, really heavily controlled. So HIV stands for the Human Immunodeficiency Virus. Now, if you break that down, immuno, immune, um, immune defence, immune system, deficiency means it's not good enough, right? It's deficient, it's got less in it than it needs to, or it should do. So what happens is HIV attacks and destroys a particular type of white blood cell, a particular type of um, lymphocyte, okay? And that is the T lymphocytes. So T lymphocytes are specific white blood cells, remember? Right, so the numbers of those T lymphocytes decrease and therefore they cannot effectively fight infection. Now, if it gets to the point where the number of T lymphocytes is so, so low that your body, the immune deficiency is so, de um, so poor and so decreased, um, your body eventually will develop what's called acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Right, so that is known as AIDS. Now, AIDS is more extreme and more severe than HIV. HIV people can live with for a long time, but when you have AIDS, it's essentially a progression of the same disease, right? And it gets much more severe. So what happens is your immune system is severely weakened. And when your immune system is severely weakened then, that leads you to being really vulnerable You can't write today, so vulnerable to other infections. So people don't tend to die of AIDS, they die of AIDS-related diseases. So they would tend to pass away from things like pneumonia or other infections that would then take hold because their immune system isn't strong enough to fight it off. Okay, and that's part of the reason why is because it destroys those memory cells as well, so therefore your body is not as effective at fighting things off as it would be. Alright, and that summarises and finishes off the specific defence for Unit 3.